Welcome back to the Race BMX Show. Johnny True Torch, everybody. Howdy. Howdy. Before I even like let him talk, I want to say, when I first came on the scene in 2018, I would see the Diamondbacks and uh, I don't even know the proper order. I might be saying things out of order, but I would see your bikes out there and I'm like, I didn't even know those companies were making those bikes. Yeah, and a lot of them aren't. Yeah, they're not. They're just retro frames that we're doing. Yeah. We're producing what wasn't produced back then. Yes, and you're doing it the way it really looked back then in an explosive size. And everybody would be like, no, this is Johnny True Torch, or Johnny True Torch. And I'm like, a Johnny True Torch. And I slowly learned who you were. And you, in my opinion, you are the most coveted and impressive uh, big bike BMX frame that's available. And I'm part of the ride out scene. You know, I came back from the East Coast after living there where I've been riding alone. Nice. Then I find Cheech and all these guys in downtown, and now I've got hundreds of friends, you know, some real good friends and some acquaintances. Yeah, all the guys from the 4130. 4130, the original ride of all, which, you know, you-, you Yeah, we did a lot of this in the early days. And how did this big bike uh, craze affect you personally, like? I originally started building the 26 inch Webco's. Um, I just wanted something different than a regular cruiser, so. I did these about 20 years ago. For yourself? Yeah. Oh, wow. And then people picked up on it and started buying them. Okay. And why did you go with Webco over Mongoose? Uh, my first sponsorship was a Webco. You were a pro rider as a kid as well? An uh, amateur sponsored rider and then later turned pro. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. Did you race with the other guys that own all the companies and do all the welding now? Yeah. Yeah. I rode for a lot of them and designed and built for a lot of the companies. And uh, were you welding as like a normal guy welder and then you just took your abilities to bikes? Yeah, or? I basically started before the frames were even out. Uh, I was modifying twin frames, turning them into monoshocks, or just make, make them so they wouldn't fold, so adding bars and things like that. So, and then it, the sport progressed and frames started to come out. Okay. And, well, I just saw Fernando like two weeks ago and we did a little video and he actually mentioned that you cut up his twins for him and stuff. Is that right? Uh, possibly. Yeah, and you did some forks for him. Yeah. You know, Fernando from Felix's Bike oh, Shop. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, you also work with Cheech on his West Side bikes? Correct. We're currently got a little project going right now. Okay, yes. Everyone's been seeing those get posted. Cheech works with this man when he gets those done. Of the bikes that you do make, what's your, oh, this, yeah, how do you feel about the ride out world? Like, was it a gift? It's great, it's kind of like BMX without going to a track. It's still everybody getting together on their bikes just to have fun. So, I didn't like it. Yeah, I agree with that. Do you make it to a lot of rides yourself? Or? Not many, my, my time is limited. I'm, I'm here about six, seven days a week. Okay. So, 10 to 12 hour days. 10 to 12 hour days? Yeah, so. I need your kind of fortitude. <laughs> yeah, it gets tiring. And then you also do uh, regular welding as well, right? Yeah, a lot of construction, work for airports, hospitals. Really? Uh, a lot of race teams, I work for all the motorcycle factory race teams as well. Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Ducati. I've um, been working with them for over 30, 40 years. Are you building their frames or repairing frames? Uh, I take a lot, I get a lot of parts from Japan, I'll modify them for the factory riders bikes. Okay. Uh, sometimes I'll just get all kinds of things in for the race team. And whether it's setting up somebody's bike a little different, uh, I'll get 20, 30 frames in, modify them all the same. But it changes year to year. Do you, are you one of the guys that makes like the prototypes and then the company? No, not the okay. prototype. We just modify it for personal riders. Oh, okay. So I, building, I mean, everybody within uh, road racing, supercross, motocross, I've just been really deep in that uh, my whole life. And uh, do you, I'm, I'm asking, but I think I know the answer. Do you also do some Aharo stuff? Yes, I've okay. built a lot of their anniversary special projects. Oh, really? Yeah. And how, how many, what does that encompass? Like how many bikes do you do when you do an anniversary? Uh, 600. You just knock out 600 frames yeah. on your own? Yeah, it's actually easier to do a lot of frames, like 1,000 or 500, than it is one or two. Oh, really? Yeah, because once you set up, you can roll and it gets real easy and it's just, you know, repetition. Okay, well, here's a guy who doesn't know about welding's question at all. Are you like, do you have them like 10 set up in a row and you just go around hitting everything? Or are you putting them in the, what's that thing called? 
Yeah. The fixture. Yeah, are you putting them in a the fixture, taking them out, putting another one in the fixture, or do you have like seven yeah. fixtures? Yeah, we'll build all the parts, and then we'll tack them up in a fixture, and they'll sit on a rack until it's time to finish welding them. And I'll usually come in on the weekends when it's quiet. Okay. And I'll just do all the finish welding. And how much time does 600 frames take? It all depends on the complexity of the frame. Uh, on the freestyle frames, they usually take a little bit longer, but. Uh, I'm not as fast as I used to be. Sure. Back when I welded for CW and I was with them for about seven years. What time period was that? <clears throat> Gosh, I have to look, but I think it was in the uh, probably the mid '80s. No way! You've been welding bikes since the '80s. Since '71. Since the '70s. Yes, I started welding, like I said, the Schwinn stuff before. Wow. BMX frames in my friend's garage. Okay. I don't I have a better understanding of you now because I thought yeah. maybe you just saw some bikes yeah. and you made one for yourself, but you've actually been making the bikes that we've been riding as children. Oh yeah, 42 different bike companies I'm up to right now that I built friends for. Wow. And you just check mark everyone you've done stuff for? It's it's a job. <laughs> Do it, it for a paycheck. What would you... Is there passion involved or is that gone away? <laughs> there is. I mean, I like it. My passion really is in restoring frames. Okay. I've been restoring frames longer than anybody. So there's, there's, so there's thousands of BMA frames out of there that were headed to the dump. You know, now they're good bikes. Do you have a favorite? Not really. I mean, they're all unique in their own way. And you were so saying some... I have, oh, sorry. I have a favorite as far as what bike to build. Okay. And I think it's the most ingenious design ever in a frame, and that would be the Mongu style, one of these right here. It's just the way it all goes together. I mean, after build, I've built millions of frames. So yeah. this is your ideal of like the perfect like the, form and the and the easiest rider. Yeah, and as far as uh, I don't know, the most iconic design uh, and simplest frame to build. Really, it would be one of these. It's just the way that it all goes together. And you said so it depends on how complex they are. What would you call the most complex frame of all? Anything freestyle with the extra tubes and bars going all over. Are, are you making freestyles in large? Um, I've made a few, but usually this keeps me busy. Okay, are those guys that come in and say, can you make a blown up one of... Oh yeah, I get that all the time. And uh, like, what is the last freestyle frame you had to make in a 29 or a 26? You know, I, I couldn't tell you. Do they creep into the newer brands and stuff? Like, do you have, on your 42 list of brands that you've worked for, you know, the guys in the ride-out world prefer the classics, but you know, Sunday and all that stuff came through Odyssey later, and some of these new frames are being built, and the freestyle bikes are brands that didn't exist during these time periods. Do you work with them as well? Uh, sometimes, but not too often. Okay. So you're basically in, involved with all the classics? All the classics, yeah. Oh, okay, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. What's the difference between making a giant freestyle frame and a, and a like, would you call this race? This is a standard frame. Uh, it really doesn't have any extra bells and whistles. I mean, other than cable guides, you know, and V-brake mounts. I love V-brakes. Are you, do you prefer V-brakes? Big, big fan. I mean, the old brakes don't stop us. They, they work when we were 80 pounds, but you know that we're, yeah, no. A lot bigger. Yeah, because sometimes still, right? Like the, what did the C or the U? I forget which people like to call it. And then it's got the two cables that split up and like, that's the Nin 90s. Yeah, what is that all about? Yeah. Too complex. And then what do you make as far as parts? I know you do the handlebars and the forks. Frames, forks. We do hubs, seat clamps. You do hubs? Yeah. What's a Johnny True Torch hub like? Oh, shit. Yeah. How do you even weld a hub? <laughs> like, oh wow. Here's our sample of our hubs right here. And these are seal bearing, if you notice, they spin extremely nice for seal bearing. Yeah, just for sitting in our hands? Yeah. That's an, well I'm not good at it like you are, but oh wow. Now, you do this with your bare hands as well, or you design yeah, everything it? Everything we share in the machine shop across the street, everything we do is American made. Okay. Even all the parts inside, the bearings are all German bearings. Okay. So nothing from China or Asia. Oh, wow. And uh, obviously that's important to you as it's a party rider. Yeah, because I think so many people just pick everyone's pocket with Asian stuff. 
And it's not the same, and they can say it's the same, but it's absolutely not. Okay, I don't even mean this in a derogatory way. But no, I don't. I don't either. I don't either. But reality, I mean, I, what I would do, I, I'll stick a piece of, you know, tubing from uh, China in my bender, and a, and a American or German chromoly in the same bender, and I'll have somebody bend it, and uh, the difference is just night and day. Like kind of like a Pepsi can versus a steel yeah, bar I mean, type of differences. Their or? chrome ball is actually softer than our steel. Oh really? It's it's, it's easier to bend. Now I've heard this from a couple other guys. You're, it's getting to the point with 430 and stuff where you can actually make it almost as light as some aluminums. Is that true? Or? Yeah, well that's the whole idea between uh, chromoly is you can go thinner wall. Okay, and is that something that you purchase thinner or you? Grind it from you, the inside. You can of order any, any thickness of material that you want. What's your preference? As far as building a frame, yes. We use only 049. We're not trying to build the lightest bike. 035 gets real easy. And what I want is my frames to be around long after I'm gone. Okay. So you know, I just want them to be sturdy, but not crazy heavy. Right. So we use 049. That's the wall thickness throughout the whole bike, pretty much in everything we build. If we get special orders, we do 035, but we don't really like it. It takes a little bit longer to weld. Uh, it doesn't come up quite as nice because you're dealing with a much thinner metal against a heavier uh, steel, like a bottom bracket. So now you're now this I'm gonna ask. Obviously, you're gonna be biased on this one though. But what's the difference between your welds and the factory welds from China and Taiwan and stuff like? I don't know a lot about welding, but all my worker guy really? friends look at your stuff and they're like, look at his piled dimes, piled nickels, and... Yeah, I mean, really nothing. I mean, <laughs> it just comes down to how, how good you're feeling. I mean, I say that, I mean, some, some times your welds don't always come out perfect. Uh -huh. and that really comes down to what you're welding up against, you know, how clean your material is and the thickness of metal. And it's just that simple? Pretty much. I mean, look, you know, the, the craftsmanship overseas and all that, I'll never mock that. The stuff looks great, and it serves a purpose. It's great for an entry-level thing, but uh, I always tell people it doesn't really have a resale value. Right. Like anything American-made like that, even Japan is high quality, and okay. it's gonna have a resale value. Uh, where the other stuff, it actually doesn't. Now, what is a Japanese bike? Like, when you say Japan, I, I didn't even know it's coming all, out of there. A lot of the early BMX stuff, uh, came from Japan and then later on they got expensive and their quality was, you know, was always high and so people went over to China. Okay. Ah. So, but the and workmanship is, is like I said all over. It's good, you know. Okay. But I'm always like, wow, I'm impressed. It looks nice. But it's the quality of the material that's Okay. And to go along with, same. with what you were saying before, I think if, especially if you don't have money, I think it's more important that you be on a bike than not be on a Ab bike? Absolutely, I, I call it like a pyramid. You got bikes that are like at the top, you know, like a vintage original Cook Brothers, goes for quite a bit of money. Like some of the Hutch stuff, a vintage stuff, goes for quite a bit of money. Sure. And you got the stuff down at the bottom and it's all the China bikes that people buy, but it gets everybody on a bike. Yeah, plus I noticed first you show up with the bike you bought on the scene, like the 4130s, then you start getting around it, then your component quality starts to rise. Yeah. Then you start hearing about Johnny True torches, and you know, like I said, you're the most covered, but you know, you're not alone. There's a few other guys out there. Then everyone starts to go with what would be considered a fancier bike. Mm -hmm. Now, to go with me saying that, do you see your bikes as show bikes or riders, or you just put that frame out and it's up to the road? Well, yes, yeah, whatever you want it to be. You know, I'm just here building them. Okay. <laughs> it's as simple as that, and I've been doing it longer than anybody. That, yeah, the 70s. Yeah. Didn't you teach some of the other guys that are welding now how to weld, or is that? I've taught a lot of people, but none that I currently know. They just go, they won't stick around building bikes. <laughs> they will out building things they make more money at. Well, so, it's more of a passion to sit here and build bikes this long. Um, what do you think? Your reputation in the time that you've served making BMX has obviously put you in a position where somebody who just decides to make BMX bikes it's is curse. never going to be there. <laughs> it's right? a curse. It's a curse? Yeah. 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 I mean, from the guys I talk to... There's times I'm sitting here welding for 14 hours straight and uh, just wondering why I'm doing it. <laughs> you know? Do you have a wife? 
Yes. Okay. Oh, oh wow. I have five right. kids. Oh, oh, you have the whole family. Yeah, they're all grown up, but. <laughs> Do they come into the shop and stuff? Yeah, my son actually works in the office. Oh, that's him over there with the mustache? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and he's usually doing sales on the phone. And where'd you come up with the name True Torch? Really, I always had it in my mind. It was before I ever even thought I was going to branch out on myself, on my own. Oh, really? So, yeah. Yeah. Do you use you use that name in all the types of welding you do, right? Pretty much. I just thought I'll just keep it all the same. Okay. And can you do any type of metal but have a preference metal or do you keep yourself? Well, yeah, I can do any kind of exotic metal, but we try to keep it to this. Um, I don't do aluminum frames just because the warranty on aluminum frames is so high. Oh, really? Yeah. When I'd be with other manufacturers, uh, we'd have a pile of maybe a hundred frames in steel. And the aluminum pile frames would be about a thousand to two thousand. Really? Yeah. Now, to go along with that question, what are you responsible for once a frame leaves your shop? Like, you're not responsible if some guy jumps it off of a house or something. No, I mean, no. But really, I mean, the people that buy these are just guys that want to relive their youth and buy okay. right, that they may have had when they were younger. Okay, now my other question, do you have a preference on like old school sizes? Or, you know, like some guys only like to use American bottom brackets, are you Euro, American, you no, know, whatever? No preference at all. I mean, I like a lot of variety in bikes. So most of our bikes have the inch, anything uh, 29 will have an inch and an eighth headset. Okay. Um, but there's times I want to build a bike with a, a threaded, you know, steer tube one inch. Okay, and also, I mean, for those of you that are can't see this, this is a 29, and you said one and one eighth. That one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'll tell you, like, when you're standing in front of it, it's done in such a smooth manner, and I don't mean it looks smaller than it actually is, but it looks like a tighter, like, it, in the sense of a 20, like. It's so smooth and tight. It's proportion. Yes, yes, that's right. So obviously, uh, do you ever invent geometries, or do you? Uh, have... Geometry is kind of a funny thing. Okay, tell me about it. It's really. It's not so much. And a lot of people would argue this, but it's not so much geometry as it is rider comfort. Okay. So, um, you always want to bottom line. You would want your bottom rack to be as slow to the ground as you can get it without hitting your pedals. Okay. You're going to get more drive that way. The higher the bottom bracket is, the more flicky the bike is going to feel. Okay. So a little more agile, a little more loose. And same with the head tube angle. Uh, it's going to cruise easier with more rake. The less rake that you have, the quicker it's going to knife, like into a turn. Okay. So really just, I try to build up a bike that still handles, handles well, but is still a little bit flickable. Okay, so when you decided to make uh, like a Diamondback or a Mongoose go from a 20 to a 26 or a 29, did you have to do some kind of proportioning to that one to extend it, or did you just do it with your eyes, or is there a lot of... You know, just knowledge in my eyes, I mean, I kind of know how a bike's going to ride. <clears throat> yeah, no, one so. bike won't ride the same for anybody, Right. because it all depends on how much you weigh, how yes. tall you are, okay. and how strong you are. Uh, like on a road bike, geometry is really important because you're in a fixed position and you're, just, you're riding, you're putting it, everything you have into it. So you're really putting that bike to extent. I mean, you're working it for a long period of time. Okay. So geometry is important there. But on a BMX bike, once you move, once you get out of the saddle, you're displacing 150, 200 pounds this way or that way, forward or back. When everything affects the way the bike handles when you do that. I mean, some of these guys weigh well over 250 yeah, and stuff. And, and all, that's all fine, but what I'm really getting at here is, like if you see a road bike guy, and they're, they're in a pack, and they're, they're just cranking down the road. Right. And they get up to do a sprint. Watch what happens to the bike. It gets loose. They're all over the place. I have seen that. It's wild. And, and that's not because they can't handle the bike. It's because now they're out of that bike's geometry, and their weight and everything is getting thrown all over them. And, uh, you know, they're trying to put so much into it, so that bike is just whipping all over the place. So, and the same thing with a BMX bike. Once you start moving about, everything changes. I mean, I have seen those kids that, oh, not even kids, but yeah, once they start going, they actually lose the uh, control of their own front wheel on a straightaway and stuff. Yeah, well, the, the bike just gets crazy because you're displacing weight all over the place. Okay, that makes sense to me. So, really, I just try to buy, build a bike that's comfortable and handles relatively well. And each one is a little bit different. 
Uh, anytime you run a frame higher or lower, that'll all kind of change the characteristic of a frame too. And so, minor stuff. Do you ever do bikes that aren't BMX? I mean, I know you have the... Uh, in the past, we've done a lot of road bike, mountain bike, all kinds of Oh, bikes. really? Yeah. You have mountain bikes out there in the world? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I used to do a lot of prototypes for companies like Trek, you know, Vega, Iron Horse. I used to do a lot of prototype frames with them, with uh, Bob and Rattle, also with Dan Hannabrink. So we would collab on a lot of things together back in the day. Oh, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, honestly, even with what I did know about you, I didn't realize that you basically had been there since the beginning. Since the beginning. Oh, that's really impressive, yeah. like, I gotta be honest. And the fact that you're still interested in it and stuff, or like you said, it's a curse, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy being Johnny True Torch, yeah. everybody. And some of the bikes go to bike shops, right? Yeah. Some of them go to personal purchasers. Mm -hmm. If someone wanted one, would you recommend they come they, here? Yeah, they can go on truetorch.com, check the website, give us a call here, and there's somebody here to answer questions. Okay. Yeah, and. and Hubs. Do you sell bikes in a complete form with all the stuff? No, we don't. Okay, you let people assemble them. No, we we'll sell the local bike shops and have them build them up for them. And you have a lot of bike shops you're friends with. Uh, yeah, quite a few. Right? Like, because I've been with... When I first started hearing about the bikes a few years ago, people had to come here. But now I'm starting to see them pop up in different bike shops. So they're just coming to get them from you and keep yeah, them they, in they the have, shop. Yeah, mostly it's shop. It's local here. No, pick up. Yeah, like even the video that kind of brought us to start getting to meet each other from Frank's, he had like two or three of your bikes right in the shop, up cool. on, on the counters and stuff. Do you want it to get bigger, or are you where you need to be right now? You know, right now, I mean, I, I literally cut and build the entire bike by myself. Okay. And it's been that way six or seven days. Okay. So, uh, when you get a bike, it's built by me. It's, nobody's had their hand in it. Maybe some tubing deburring or something like that. But I learned you to do everything here. We machine the bottom brackets, head tubes. We polish all our tubes here in house. Uh, here's a question I've always wanted to ask a water. Do you have to buy like the bottom bracket tubes and you cut can. them down to bottom brackets, or are you getting? Do you assemble stuff that already exists? We do both. Okay. We, we machine a lot of it, build a lot of it here. And then sometimes if there's a big run, we'll, we'll order. And a lot of times, uh, I believe it's FSR. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, and now, what's the, what's your, what do you ride? What's your bike you ride the most? If you had to grab one out of the garage. Probably one of my vintage beach, <laughs> beach swing. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, you're a swing clunker guy? One of my whole clunkers, yeah. Do they have BMX? They are clunkers, right? You got BMX, your own BMX bikes yeah, on yeah, and yeah. stuff? That's pretty great. I mean, I don't know what more to ask. I mean, usually when I build a bike up for myself, or we ride it and somebody will want to buy it, and I literally just get off and find a ride home. I guess it's an advantage of being able to go home and just weld another we'll bike together, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have people buying the bike it right out from underneath you? Oh, yeah. What's your uh, preferred brakes? Uh, V-brakes. Yeah, but I mean, do you have a particular brand you always go to, or you've been uh, involved for so long, you mix it up? And I mean, they, they all work. Yeah, that's true too. They don't really, one doesn't really work better than the other. It comes down to aesthetics. Yes. So do you have like a classic? Like you have one style you like on For your For myself, yeah. I usually buy the cheapest thing I can get. Oh, listen to this. <laughs> so, you never just weld a little no. tiny brake lever and no. stuff? That's really awesome. And then do you have a local guy that makes your stickers and stuff? Or are you guys doing We have a lady too? right around the corner here that makes them for me. And what's really neat is everything we do Sticker wise is silk screen. Okay. So I, I do uh, I do all the design work myself, and then I take it to her and uh, you you do the you're doing the fonts and the colors. The fonts, the colors, the separation, everything. Are you one of those guys that draws them out first, or are you doing them on the computer first? I draw them out and then we do them on the computer. And you're not just made in the USA. It sounds like this complex has got your sticker person, yeah. your machinist in it. But again, like I said, back to stickers, they're not digital printed. So these stickers will be around longer than me. They're all silk screened with uh, ink that's been around forever. I mean, really, really good ink. It's not, nothing's digital printed. Okay, so it's all silk screened. 
a certain layman's terms, because I'm actually pretending I know what you're talking about right now. You're saying that that's a thicker ink and a thicker sticker made of a denser material? The material is whatever you can get. Oh, okay. It's the ink that is uh, just super quality. It's, it's more of a real oil-based ink. So when you say silk, silk screening a sticker, does that mean that the... Like they would do a t-shirt. Okay, so that ink is being absorbed into the sticker. Well, it's printed through a screen. Okay. You see, you know, they squeegee it right on. I've so seen that on shirts, but never on a sticker. Yeah. And I never said this about stickers before, but these are actually phenomenal looking stickers. You can see what he's talking yeah, about. They don't scratch. They don't fade. They don't have a clear coat over them to protect them. They don't? They don't, they don't need it. Really? Because this is real ink. This is real printed ink, just like a t-shirt would be. Oh, wow. That's actually... Yeah, so we spent a lot of money having the decals done right. And he's even got the 4130 in there, which, just to refer back to the original ride group, that's the reason they're named 4130, because once upon a time, every bike had the 4130 sticker yeah. on it, right? Until the aluminums came along. And then, then that NorCal group named themselves 6061 after 4130 and stuff. So what are you, uh, I don't want to say pushing right now, but what do you feel like you have in stock right now that you'd like people to come in and get? Like a, It, it uh, varies month to month, because you know, this inventory hall here will be gone soon. And uh, you know we're back there building more right now, so. What are you working on right now? Anything particular or a little bit of everything all the time? Yeah, a little bit of everything all the time. And uh, do you like, are you a guy who prefers powder coating or chroming, or you like it all? Uh, we don't care for chroming too much. We oh, would no. rather powder coat everything. Okay. Chroming is just such a pain in the butt. Does it have to go to Arizona now to get chrome powder? No, I mean, well, everyone says one chromer is better than another, and it's ex complete false information. No chromer can be better than another chromer. Okay. You know, it's just not possible because chroming is a chemistry. So uh, the chemistry changes throughout the day. You know, whether it's a hot day or a cold day, there's water evaporation from the tanks. And also, depending on how many parts that they're dripping through those chrome tanks, you know, uh, they're pulling out material, right? So however big that part is pulling out material. <clears throat> so you've got a balance between evaporation and uh, draw of material. And so chemistry has to be done within a cer certain realm, you know, and it's, it's a small window where that chrome is the most efficient. Oh, really? So throughout the whole day, they've got to monitor that, you know, so it's, it's, the balance is going up and down like this, and they're trying to stay in there. So every chrome shop's gonna work out the same. So you know, they all have to operate within that certain window. So a hot day at three o'clock could be a worse chrome job than an air conditioned day Dep at eleven o'clock. Depending if or is that too soon? Depending if a, a chemical or some materials uh, deplete, you know, faster than the other. Oh wow. So it changes throughout the day. It comes down to, uh, you know, the polishing. Okay. You know, how well the polishing is. That's really the key to a, a good chrome job coming out. And that include, that's also applies to getting a, uh, an aluminum bike anodized, right? Like the polishing is... Oh, polishing is everything. Polishing is everything. They will make or break a frame. Okay. You so know, they can either over polish it and just destroy all the, you know, the weld beads and everything. You're telling me an over polishing can almost sand the welds down? Oh yeah, very often they do. And a lot of pe people that are restoring a frame will have that problem. Oh really? And then we're talking about straight up polishing, not the ball burnish polishing, right? No, that's usually done on aluminum. Okay, and that's just, they just put it in the machine and it gets bounced Correct. around? Oh wow. You really know everything. I mean, you're basically, are you officially an engineer? Not officially, but <laughs> it's, but it sounds like you have the yeah, knowledge yeah. of all that. I've right? been in that phase with with everybody I've ever worked with. So. Oh wow, um, that's really it's really amazing. I'm really glad that I got to sit down here and talk to you. And like you said, you're too busy, but obviously you're welcome to meet up with us on any ride ever. Sure. And uh, he's always here. Everyone's heard about his bikes. Everybody wants his bikes, and it's worth it. Not to mention, even some of the companies that are kind of trying to remake their bikes, they're not making the bike like you're making no. the bike. Like. like I said, these are all U.S. made, you know, by one guy. Yeah, but this is like straight up the bike you had when you were a kid, but larger. Yeah. Yeah. That is really impressive.
And what's your favorite of the bikes you replicate? Uh, I, I don't really have a favorite, but oh, okay. one thing I will say is uh, I won't build my bikes cheaper, but I will use steel on a lot of my bikes, personal bikes. So I won't use Promoly. Okay, why? I actually use steel. Why? It rides smoother. Oh, just a stronger, heavier ride? or It's not a stronger, heavier ride. Oh. It's just a smoother ride. Meaning the frame is tighter, like what you were describing? It absorbs the, more of the road vibration. Oh, okay. So if you've ever ridden like a Schwinn Beach Cruiser, or you, you'll ride whatever bike you want, and you hop on a Schwinn Beach Cruiser, and you ride that thing, you go, man, this thing rides so nice. Okay. It's because it's made out of steel. Are you building for comfort when you ride yourself? When I, ride, when I, I build bikes for me, I am. Okay, yeah. Because yeah. I know how the bike's going to ride. Okay, because yeah, like I know, I just in real life we just ride around the city and as crazy yeah. as it gets, it's riding down a staircase or jumping three stairs. I'm not. Well, if I think like, people think uh, a steel frame is cheap, but it's probably not true. I mean, look at the Schwinn frames that are all still around today. Yeah, I know, and they they become even more popular again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it it lasts. It's good. It's not as light, and you can say it's not as strong. But, uh, I mean, that's a lot. I'm not pushing anything to its max anymore. How many local Schwinns have you cut into in the last bunch of years? I'd probably say in the last, at least say in the last year, close to a thousand. No way. Yeah. Yeah, we modify them. We, we put BMX dropouts on them. We put uh, V-brake tabs on them. Oh, really? Uh, we swap them out to loop tails. Oh, really? Yeah. And then you turn some 26s into 29s, is that correct? Uh, we turn 26s into 29s. I mean, really anything you can do to them. And you're the guy doing it, and I think it's a great idea, but just for some kind of weird purist out there, do you have any issues with cutting into an old bike and making it bigger? You don't feel there's no guilt? Yeah, it's out a long time ago. Okay. <laughs> there's no, like, this is not the way, you know, it should be. No. Uh, I'm not a purist. You know, these are bikes, and they're made to have fun, and you just go for it. You know, that's, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Because yeah. sometimes when guys rebuild, they're all over the internet finding the exact part from like 1982. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's yeah. all part of the hunt. You know, I mean, when you really get into something, you, know, you want to do the best that you can. That's true. And, and that's, you know, how people think. And they just want to get every part just right. And I've never been that way. I mean, I, I, used, I used to put bikes in bike shows a little bit, and I'd bring them in dirty. I'd never wipe them down. Were you winning under those circumstances? I was. Oh, get out! I was. You were bringing your own bikes in, or the bikes like the Schweiz? Bikes that I'm currently riding, something that I might, my light is spilled or something. Oh, wow. But uh, yeah, I won't even clean my bikes before. <laughs> I mean, if you're right. I'll even dirty because that's the way they should be viewed. I mean, that's why we built these things, to, to ride them in the dirt. That's true. So, uh, I like things that look authentic. I mean, I hear you. Like, I don't know whether to use the word authentic, but. When I see your stuff, like, it just looks fucking badass, you know? Like, you're making choices that exceed and equal the coolest hot rods, the coolest uh, motorcycles, you know? It's not just a bike, like, yeah. you're part of the culture, the X culture of all hot rods and, and customized projects and stuff. And this reaches those same levels. It's just an exquisite piece of machinery. And it's just a bike all at the same time, It's right? just a bike. You know, they're made to ride and enjoy. Okay. And uh, for those of you... And nobody can have just one. <laughs> no, no. I have three right now, and I live in a studio apartment. It's crazy. But, uh, yeah. Because once you build that latest idea, you've got another one brewing. Yeah. Or they get done, or someone... Or something comes along that's so inexpensive, or somebody gives you something else, and then all of a sudden you got to fill it up with parts. It starts and, all over again. Yeah. Do you have a place where you keep a bunch of your bikes? Is your garage full, or do you keep them here in the warehouse? Uh, actually, the only bikes I have right now are right in the warehouse here, and you might want to take a picture of those later. Yeah, I'm going to do that after this. I mean, normally I can go on forever, but I don't even really know what to ask you next because you've just given so much information, and. Uh, I do want you to be able to get back to work. One thing that I'm fascinated with that has nothing to do with the rest of this conversation, they've been doing 20 mil hubs lately. And you know they had to have different dropouts. They only fit on a couple bikes. Do you ever uh, think in those terms? Like, no. Okay. No. You like things to be the way they're old school. Okay, do you do 15 mil for the freestyle? On request, but okay. not something personally that I'll build. 
Okay, got it. I have nothing currently going on like that. Okay, and when you cut the dropout off of a screen and put your own dropout on, is there scars or your welding is so no, good? No, I try to make it, you can't even tell the frame's been touched. Really? Yeah, I try to make it look just like it should. Yeah, I mean. So be it, if the frame's not an ugly weld, I'll put an ugly weld on it. I'll try to keep it all uniform. Uh, the one I just saw two weeks ago with Fernando that you did, it's like, it was like from the 30s. Uh -huh. And you would never know that you had touched it. Exactly. And that's the idea, is to make it look like it should. Do you like them to stay in like patina form and stuff? Or do you powder coat yeah, them? That would depend on the patina. Okay. You yeah. know, some patina is just amazing to look at. Uh huh. And some is just like, this is horrible. Okay. And I'm assuming you have powder coated friends as well. Or do you guys do that here too? No, we do powder okay. coating. We use Specialized in Huntington Beach. Uh, Kelly over there has been really good, you know, with us. And he's just amazing to work with. So he gets all our work. Amazing, like polite or amazing, polite and efficient and fast? Uh, efficient, fast. I mean, he gets it done. Okay. All right. Well, shout out to him. We'll tag yeah. him too. All right. I'd like to thank you so yeah. much. I really, truly appreciate that. And for those of you that are going to be around on June 2nd and... Win this bike. You have, we have like uh, something on a whole nother level. Uh, I'm going to talk to the guys because I, you know, didn't let everyone know that we were going to have this until I had it. And uh, I'm going to make it very open and give everyone an opportunity to uh, buy in. It's going to a great cause, as a lot of you may or may not know. Uh, our very good friend was also. A long-term rider. He was there from day one like Cheech, but he was there when the safety crew was invented. Uh, he lost his closest person, lost his wife. And uh, we're doing this to keep him and the kids on track because they're such a kind family and such a big part of the bike world. And uh, at one point, Johnny said we should do something. And I felt like I never had anything good enough to bother you about. But then this made me realize, like, now it's time to reach out to Johnny. So thank you very much. Here you are. You got a frame? All right. Race BMX Give show. And this one is on the block, everybody. The Probably one of the, I don't know, it's so sick. It's like, I can't even Yeah, this one's got the translucent black, so you see all the weld lines inside of it. Yeah, it's, it's got the Dennis Dane replica decals. He was always known as the Red Baron. Yeah, well, my Red Baron was always Snoopy, but I hear you, you know. <laughs> you remember that? And this was, uh, what, he was a, a rider back in the day? Yep, he's a famous 70s rider, rode for a lot of different teams. Like, even I was, you know, I'm an 80s kid, so I, even I don't know the 70s riders. Like, by the time I was buying BMX Plus and BMX Action, like, Stu Thompson was pretty much the pinnacle when I started becoming aware. Yeah. But you seem to know way, way more. And he still is. <laughs> he is, right? I got to meet him at the, at the uh, I forget what that show was called. The BMXA did that event, and he's still such a very nice man and stuff. Are you still in touch with all your yep. friends from the past? I sure am. Do you guys do reunions? I don't do too many reunion things. Like I said, I'm yeah, you're too busy. You're way busy. Yeah, and if I'm not building bikes, I'm usually off riding more, you know, motorcycles somewhere. So. Oh, what's your motorcycle style? Uh, off road. So I do a, I used to do a lot of off road racing. So you're like a dirt bike rider? Dirt bike, yeah. I brought a Beta 390 and a Husqvarna Norton on 901. Oh, really? So. Now, do you ever cut those up? No, but I tear them up. <laughs> you tear them up? You know what you're doing with those, too? Uh, not always. <laughs> <laughs> not when I'm picking them up off the ground. But, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you still crash every once in a while? Well, yeah, I still push it when I shouldn't. Oh, really? Yeah. I went pro for a long time, so. Oh, so yeah, you're still like a badass. Sometimes I still think I am. Oh, yeah? And, and I'm not. So you switched from BMX riding to motorcycle riding? I always rode motorcycles and raced motorcycles when I was doing BMX as well. Uh, that was actually the case with a lot of you guys back then, mm -hmm. right? Isn't yeah. it the dirt bikes that led to the dirt bicycles? Or? Well, of course, I couldn't afford a motorcycle in the beginning. Okay. Because I did get one, uh, I raced it for a year before my mom even knew I had one. Okay. And I got a magazine and then that changed all that. I mean, are we talking back like when the BMX bikes still had the round frame that's like a cruiser frame now? Like, my first Schwinn Scrambler was not like this. <laughs> my first dirt bike was in 77. 76, 77. And what was it? 
A YZ125. A YZ125. Wow. That's what they yeah, 121, my friend. I'm bad at motorcycles. I'm way safer on a bike. But uh, yeah, uh, I already said goodbye to you on here once, but like, you were a fascinating guy. 